Hi, and welcome to our virtual Farmer Shop Talk series. I'm your host, Amanda Gumbert, an Extension Specialist for Water Quality at the University of Kentucky. You are viewing the third of four conversations originally conducted in winter 2021. This virtual Farmer Shop Talk series was an opportunity to have meaningful conversations with farmers and experts about practical ideas and programs that can help you weather hard times and have success with stewardship practices on your farm. We thank you for viewing this recording and hope that this interaction leaves you recharged and sparks new ideas that are applicable to your production system or to those whom you serve. This virtual Farmer Shop Talk series was developed by a dedicated project team who work across the Mississippi and Atchafalaya River basins at different land grant universities. With funding from the EPA Gulf of Mexico Farmer to Farmer program, we have a long-term vision of improving farm sustainability and protecting soil and water resources. We also recognize the many challenges and sources of stress for producers. And while there are many risks and challenges on the farm, we know that there are producers who are methodically making calculated changes to their production systems in ways that are supporting their overall profitability as well as stewardship. While we had planned to be having these conversations as part of an on-farm field day, we are excited to offer these farmer-focused interactions in a virtual platform. We hope that you find these conversations as meaningful as we did and that you leave each session with at least one good idea. Today's speakers who will be talking about making progress through on-farm trials are Ms. Amber Raditz from Wisconsin Discovery Farms, Mr. Steve Stevens, a farmer from Arkansas, and Mr. Adam Lash, a farmer from Wisconsin. Amber Raditz is the co-director of Wisconsin Discovery Farms. She has a technical background in manure management and nutrient loss, and I love it when people say they've got a technical background in manure. My coworkers at UK like to laugh at that, but that's, I love it. Um, so um, Amber um, has a special interest in program development, grant writing, and communications. Um, she received her, her bachelor's and master's degrees in soil science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She and her husband, Tim, have three young boys, and they live in western Wisconsin. So um, I will stop talking, Amber, and it's all you. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, so um, in the breakout, I didn't get a chance to share who I was really, but I figured you all would get to hear from me plenty. So um, my husband and I uh, actually both do Discovery Farms work. So my husband, Tim, is the coordinator of the Minnesota Discovery Farms program. And um, we don't have a farm, but we do have um, these three young boys who are just like trying to tend to a herd of animals most of the time. Um, so we... Um, we both grew up on dairy farms and um, felt like it was uh, such an opportunity for us to be able to work back with farmers and help, like uh, Beth mentioned in our session, to be able to create this bridge between um, actually what's going on on the ground and research and the way that policy affects those things and how we implement conservation in the real world. So. Um, uh, so yeah, so today I'm happy to share a little bit about Wisconsin Discovery Farms. Um, I tried not to get too much into tons of data and um, I'm going to kind of stay up on the, the prioritization sort of 5,000 foot level a little bit to be able to um, share with you some things that I think are really important as we continue to consider this on-farm trials thing uh, and um, doing work in cooperation with real farms. So in Wisconsin, um, the, oh, no, you don't want to move. Okay. In Wisconsin, the Discovery Farms program uh, started in 2001, actually, so we're about 20 years old, and really started as a response to policies that were being um, proposed in the state that would be really difficult for a lot of the farmers to um, be able to adhere to. And at that time, there wasn't much on-farm data that was going into scientific policymaking or um, into the um, into the 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 sort of modeling efforts or things like that. A lot of it was done on plot research, and so a really 
innovative group of Wisconsin farmers got together with Dennis Frame and Fred Madison, who started Discovery Farms and said, we want to bring the research farm out to our farms. And so they started this program that has these three pillars, which are farmer leadership, on-farm research, and outreach. And so what that means in Wisconsin anyways, and also um, for Mike in Arkansas and the farmers that he works with there and the farmers that work with the program in Minnesota, farmers are really involved from the very first step of getting research on the ground. And so not only do they host monitoring stations, like you can see in the middle, middle and um, right picture there, they host stations like that, but they're also involved in kind of the determination of what's an important thing to, to be learning, what's important out on the farmscape instead of just, um, oh, I think this is a really interesting research question from my spot in my office, really bringing um, that perspective of what we need to know more about on the farm. And so farmer leadership also sometimes translates to them kind of being the people that spread the message of like the ways that this partnership has either helped them realize things about their own system or um, helped us realize things about their system that are um, you know important for important to share. So farmers become not only the ones that help us decide on the research priorities, host the equipment, but then also actually help in some of those messaging pieces too. Um, so you can see, like I said, the stations in Wisconsin, we primarily do um, surface water edge of field research. So that means installing something like the station on the uh, right picture there where there's um, sampler and that's attached to the um, flume, which is this uh, V-shaped thing. Yeah, that green V-shaped thing, that's a flume and it's installed in a field with a wing wall and a berm so that water is really directed through that and we're able to take samples and um, know how much water how much water went through that station, when it went through, and then also the nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment components that are in that water. Here's a kind of schematic look at it. Um, you know, one of the things this is, this is, there's been some uh, adjustments since we started in 2001, but in 2001, this was like a really out there sort of way to try to monitor these things. And um, we've, we've gotten better at doing it over the years, but uh, a lot of the principles have stayed the same. So in Wisconsin, there are parts of the state that are tile drained. And so we do some, we have done some tile drainage work, but uh, most of our data set comes from this surface water type work. And then we also engage in some special projects like nitrogen use efficiency is one that uh, has been really an interesting project to be part of the last uh, probably almost five years now. Um, and so that project started as a way for us to not have to install monitoring equipment on every single field in the state, but also be able to involve more farmers in this idea of on-farm trials, evaluating their own systems. So in Wisconsin, the um, focus for water quality for quite a while has been on phosphorus and surface water quality. And um, you know, in that like five years ago time period, it started to become apparent that nitrogen was gonna become more of a driver of how um, policy decisions were made and something that farmers needed to have a better handle on. And so we started this nitrogen use efficiency project with goals of being able to allow farmers to evaluate their systems and assess whether they needed to make changes. And also really to just have that roadmap and really good documentation available for how they do make decisions. So um, our goal in this, in the, in all of our projects is not necessarily to tell a farmer exactly that you need to do this thing or you need to do that thing or you need to stop doing this thing. It's to have a more intelligent conversation about agriculture's impacts on water quality. And so um, for each individual farmer, allowing them to have our job, we feel is to give them the very best information and tools available, and then allowing them to adapt those things onto their farm in the way that works for them. So this nitrogen use efficiency project um, has been on, I think the data sets up to close to 300 fields now in the state and really been a great way to uh, get some good discussion going 
among farmers about their nitrogen management strategies and how maybe soil health has changed their nitrogen dynamics in their systems and also just allowing empowering them to be able to have the ability to know how to evaluate their system going forward. Um, so really one of the things that we sort of focused on is the fact that uh, we don't have all of the answers and we don't have all of the information. It's really a partnership to allow people to do that evaluation in sort of a continuous improvement sort of methodology. So just like to kind of drive that point home, we're really committed to turning research into information that farmers and farmer advisors can readily use and apply to their own landscapes and farming systems. And um, in all of our projects, what you know, it's interesting from like an academic point of view, you can always, you can have a hypothesis and you can think you know exactly how things are gonna turn out. You have to also be ready to things aren't exactly as you thought they would be, or they don't turn out exactly as you thought. And there's really a lot of learning to happen in that middle part. And that's what is so awesome about working with farmers. And so um, like, if you are a person that, you know, if you're a farmer, if you're a farm advisor and, and have goals of working in, working on on-farm trials with farmers and, uh, or evaluating your own systems, I don't necessarily think we have the, all the answers in terms of how to do that. Uh, I think it's more about a mindset. And I think this mindset is really, really important uh, and has been one of the reasons that Discovery Farms has been successful. I don't think there's something you know, super, um, super like superhero-y about the Discovery Farms name. It's about this um, kind of uh, methodology of working right there with farmers and allowing farmers to have the tools to do that evaluation. So I uh, am kind of going out on a limb here and I'm gonna take an example from a different part of life that really struck me this week. So, um, you know, we've, I'm gonna attempt to make a connection between COVID and how we've used conservation systems on our farms. And this is a great um, venue to try to do this because since we're virtual, no one can like throw things at me um, <laughs> like they maybe could if we were in person. So uh, let me set this up before you before you lose me here. So um, this was part of an article that I read earlier this week, and basically it was an article about science communication and about the fact that we, um, in general, it is uh, there's a lot of disconnect between science and then the people that are supposed to actually follow science or implement it in terms of being in the general public. And so in this article, um, they talked a lot about the ways that the messaging around what we knew at that time of the COVID situation could have been better to have better outcomes. And what really struck me about this article was that there's a lot of overlap between what has happened with science communication and COVID and all of the um, the this or the that and all of the things that went with it really has some some things that that pair well with what we work with within farming and conservation and trying to um, trying to work together in that realm too. So this part of the article was about um, was about this kind of uncertainty that people still talk about about um, like once you're vaccinated, how your life could change and. Um, there still is all this like swirling around, oh, but if even if you're vaccinated, you still really shouldn't change anything. You still really aren't safe. You still really aren't this or that or whatever. And um, there's, it's like this worry that there's potentially reckless behavior among the vaccinated. And, um, and so instead of having like a nuanced message about, yes, you're vaccinated and, and here are the things that could be priorities for how you change your life, but while realizing that uh, other people's lives haven't quite changed yet, there's there's just this feeling that we can't we can't put a message out there that has any sort of uncertainty or trade offs or um, recognition for something that isn't an absolute. We just we just seem to be really interested in having absolutes. And so if I change a few words in here, and um, change the context of this to no longer be about COVID, but now about farmers and conservation practices and water quality, I really see a big propensity among 
um, you know, lots of different groups that are trying to have a have a place in this space, whether it's academic, whether it's um, uh, like a nonprofit type organization, whether you know, whether it's um, our a different set of advisors. There seems to be this like worry that we can't have a nuanced message. We can't admit that something may or may not be perfect. We can't um, we can't just have this intelligent conversation about water quality and about conservation practices and allow people to make their own choices. And I think that that's the, that's the crux of what I really enjoy about Discovery Farms and a real priority for us is that there is no silver bullet that covers every situation. There's, there's only the ability to arm people with accurate and, um, and, and well, and information that really can be used in their lives. And so, um, so for us, what we go for is not a silver bullet approach. We really do not prescribe to farmers that this is exactly the way that things should be, but more about here's all the things we know. And once you understand those pieces, then it will be easy for you to implement them on your farms. So here's kind of my favorite example. This is the only data that I put into the presentation. So um, tillage and no-till sort of become these like, um, so Josh McGrath talked last week and I always love listening to Josh. I just think he's fascinating and he always makes me think, which is really like my favorite part about him. And um, plus he's brilliant, but, uh, but so, he wrote an article in cooperation with a bunch of other uh, folks a few years ago where they sort of talked about things as sacred cows or sacrificial lambs. And so we have this propensity to say like tillage is bad and no till is good. And it's really not that simple, right? There are, there are way, there's way many shades of gray in between those two statements. And so I think our job is to unpack those shades of gray in the middle so that you can understand as a farmer, as a farm advisor, how to like elevate the conversation a little bit beyond that, um, that sort of one way approach. So in our Wisconsin, and this is actually Wisconsin and Minnesota Discovery Farms data. And on this first graph, you can see in our annual soil loss in pounds per acre, fields that were tillage fields. So that meant there was two or more passes of tillage to prepare the seedbed. Um, that the range, I really want you to pay attention to the fact that the range of annual soil loss from those fields is a big range. You know, obviously 90% of the data falls below 2000 pounds of soil loss per acre per year, but there's a big range there, which just in this indicates a bigger risk that um, different conditions could lead, could lead to bigger soil losses, but that the median number, which is at 193 pounds per acre, shows that most of the time, you know, 50% of the time, um, our data is at 193 pounds per acre per year or less. So that means most of the time it's not a disaster. It's really, but it really is about a risk level. And so when it comes to no-till, I will say, I will be the first to say that no-till is very, very good at the job of reducing the risk of soil loss. So from what we've seen from our data, no-till definitely is the thing that reduces your risk of soil loss. Over, uh, over doing tillage, that is for sure. The problem is, is that it's not the last thing to think about when we have to think about water quality. So now that I've flashed these other two graphs up here, the middle graph is total phosphorus loss from our sites, from our uh, surface water sites. And then the graph on the right is the dissolved phosphorus loss. So now total phosphorus loss is a combination of dissolved and particulate. And you can kind of think of particulate soil loss is the, or particulate phosphorus loss is the phosphorus loss that would be attached to soil. So it's uh, kind of bound to soil. And for a long time, that was the method that we thought that phosphorus was mostly lost by was when it was being bound to soil. And so we said, if you can control soil loss, you've controlled phosphorus loss, good job. Well, now we know that there's also dissolved phosphorus losses. And so what you can see from that total phosphorus loss graph, that between tillage and no-till, those big differences have sort of resolved themselves. And so we don't see huge differences between tillage farms and no-till farms when it comes to actual phosphorus loss. And that's sort of the crux of the problem, right? So we've controlled our soil situation, but we're not done. 
because now we have this phosphorus question and that's driven by dissolved phosphorus losses. So what happens in no-till systems is we don't do that soil mixing and we don't, do, we don't deliver nutrients necessarily below the surface all the time. And so we get, this, um, we get this stratified layer of nutrients at the surface that can be readily picked up by water that moves across it. And especially here in Wisconsin and Minnesota where we have a longer frozen ground period and we're pretty much always gonna have water that moves off the surface during our frozen ground period, that's when we see those dissolved phosphorus losses happening. So in this conversation, it is not about, um, is it no-till or is it tillage? Because I certainly would not say, well, to fix this dissolved phosphorus problem, we better just go back to, to all tillage. We need to throw no-till out the window. It's, it's no good. That, that's not the message here. The message here is that no-till does really work for our soil loss problem. We need to figure out the next step to help it figure out our phosphorus problem. So that's what um, that's what we're trying to strive for in this idea of like taking on-farm data and not just having it be one conclusion from that data. There's this this world of things that are worth discussing. And so my goal today was really to help um, feed some of that discussion. So uh, this, is the, this is the way to find our information. Um, Erica from our team has done an awesome job of having um, websites and um, social media resources that are super helpful. There's also lots of videos on the MAWRC page, which is the Minnesota Discovery Farms page. That's the Minnesota Ag Water Resources Center. So um, with that, I will just leave you a uh, obligatory picture of my kids because I think that they're the cutest kids in the world, especially when they're not fighting with each other and not um, asking me for more snacks. So <laughs> that's all I've got for now, Amanda. Thank you, Amber. We have one quick question for you um, regarding your data slides. Um, yeah. Were those um, fields all corn and soybeans? No, there's a variety of crops in here. So there would be a good amount of alfalfa, corn, soybeans. There's also corn silage and corn grain. Um, so yep, there'd be a variety of crops. Okay, great. Thank you so much for presenting that. I, I'm sure folks are gonna have a number of questions for you. Um, we're gonna save questions for that are directed to Amber for right now um, because we have Mr. Steve Stevens, he's going to be our next panelist. Um, and um, I learned in the breakout that um, he didn't give me this in his bio, but he's got a lot of experience with irrigation. So all of our irrigation questions are going to go to Mr. Stevens. Um, um, Mr. Stevens grew up working um, on the farm when he wasn't attending school. I'd say a lot of us maybe have those experiences in our in our growing up. Um, he attended the University of Arkansas, and after that, he returned to full-time farming with his dad in 1971. Um, he took on more responsibility each year until his dad retired in 1983. Um, he began working with reduced tillage in the early 1980s. Um, but he says his story is going to begin today in 1992 when he engaged the help of university researchers um, for on-farm trials and, and he's going to tell us about his experience with those on-farm trials and how um, that partnership continues today. Um, so Mr. Stevens, I believe um, you can either share your screen or we have, um, Andrew can also share his screen with your slides. Would you prefer Andrew to run your slides? Uh, we'll see if we can make the share screen okay. work. Um, let's see here. So we're seeing your screen. We just need to see your slides. If you'll yep. scroll over to PowerPoint. There we go. Yeah, we're good. Um, I was asked to talk about progress through on-farm trials, and we have a vast history going way back um, on that. Um, you know, you mentioned that um, we're going to start in 92. I'm actually going to start back a little earlier. When fuel got really high in the early 80s, we went from, I'll say, dad's way of doing things of 
anywhere from eight to 14 trips to get the planter, which we pretty well destroyed our soil structure, um, to trying to just run a set of bedders in the, um, in the, um, in the interdeck, introduction, I think we've pretty much already taken care of. But uh, as you can see on the left, where we basically just run a set of bedders um, behind the uh, stalk cutting with, with cotton, we actually started out doing this in, in uh, March. And what we always found is, is the fields were still kind of clotty and, and you just couldn't hold moisture. And we, we struggled with getting stands all the way through the 80s and into the early 90s. I just got tired of having to irrigate crops up. I mean, it, it was just wrong time of year to try to do that. And a lot of times we were, we were laying gated pipe because the poly pipe would pretty much be destroyed with the trips. And that was just so much work. And um, I'd read a little bit in Louisiana where they were bedding in the fall and, and planning on that and having good success. So I thought, well, let's see if we can bring this to Arkansas. So in the fall of 92, which is when this picture was taken, I mean, right behind the, the pickers, we shredded the stalks and, and started the bedders. We had a young weed scientist um, that had been in the university for a couple of years, came out of Tennessee, had his PhD and had been working on the experiment station with spring burn downs, uh, Roundup 2,4-D with some kind of residual, maybe Germoxone 2,4-D with some kind of residual. And I, I told him what I wanted to do. And I said, what kind of residuals do we need to put out in the fall? And he said, no, don't put anything out. Uh, we'll do it in spring. And I said, you're not going anywhere, are you? And he said, nope, I'll be here. Charlie held my hand for about three or four years as we got, got this thing perfected. It was very, very successful. We had very good luck getting stands. And within five years, this became the predominant practice in the Mid-South. And it reduced those, those multiple tillage applications that most people were still doing down to basically uh, one, one trip with a set of bedders and then knock the top off the moisture and plant. This is kind of what we strive for. Uh, and over the winter rains that would settle down and, and the soil would, would get real mellow and no clods in it, real easy to get stands. This is a good time to talk about another research deal. Cotton Incorporated had um, enlisted Bill Robertson, our cotton specialist, and throughout the rest of this program, I'm just going to refer to him as Bill. Um, he did a potash study on our farm. In fact, it was uh, three farms across the state. We were the southern location of applying different rates of potash. Well, all my life, I had heard when you put out potash for next year's crop, it just takes a long time for it to work. The thing that stood out on this application, he had one of the, one of the uh, applications, he waited until 10 days before bloom to apply potash. It wasn't statistically higher, but it was numerically higher for the two years that Bill did this. And I thought, well, if it'll work on potash, it'll certainly work on pea because we were a rice farmer at that time and we had high pH soils. And the phosphorus would get tied up with the pH, with a high pH. So in rice, when you needed to add pea, you put it out just before the flood. Well, it made sense. Well, if you put it out early spring, it's going to tie up with the, because of the, the high pH. So at that time, back in the, uh, I'll say, late 90s, we started applying our fertilizer, our, our PK, sulfur, whatever else was applied after stand establishment, which means we had less opportunity for the fertilizer to leach out of the soils from the spring rains. Well, moving on from that, we pretty well had that figured out. In 2008, I was attending a crop management meeting, which Arkansas puts on to, to train um, um, consultants. They have to have so many points every year to continue. Well, as a farmer, I just paid my money like everybody else and try to learn. That's, that's kind of been my, my MO is I try to learn all I can from people that know more than I do. We had been using polytubing since, oh, probably late 80s. And um, 
we had a problem with uh, uh, probably the last third wasn't putting out the water. The first two thirds was, and you get the first two thirds out, and the last third was halfway up in the field. And I mean, it, we were just wasting so much water. I'd get sick when I when I went drove the lower ends. A field tacker, a, a ag engineer, and he he kind of liked to work in water had come up with the faucet program. I think it came out of Missouri. And he said, Steve, we've got a computer program that will, that will save 40% of your pumping cost. And um, uh, I'd like for you to come down to my room and I'll, I'll show you how it works. And I thought, you're telling me a computer is gonna save me 40% of my pumping cost? You're crazy. But I, I went down uh, a couple hours later and I listened to what he, had to say, and I still had doubts. And he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I challenge you to do six fields. You don't like it, you know, that's, that's good. You can just say it didn't work. I said, will you help me set it up, Phil? And he said, yeah, I will. He came down and we set up two, maybe three fields. And he was teaching me how to work the program at all as we went to that. And I saw what it was doing. And diesel was approaching $4. We'd started pumping in May that year, had, had a lot of corn. We were 50% corn that year, which uses a lot of water. And I said, we got to do this on the whole farm. I did 155 fields, 450 sets in a matter of two and a half weeks. And my return on investment, my time spent in the office during that two and a half weeks was about 100 hours. And um, that was office time. I still had the rest of the farm I had to, I had to take care of. I saved $100,000 that year on pumping, just on fuel, on pumping cost. In addition, 40% less time running your motors and your wells meant 40% less repair. But the most important thing, we use 40% less water. And our groundwater was was depleting. We were losing about 10 inches a year in our ground groundwater. This program just totally changed our farming operation. And I saw what it was doing. I started trying to get neighbors to do it. A lot of reluctance. Um, Mississippi came up and um, started the program. It, it hit Delta Farm Press from uh, a presentation we'd done in, in uh, conservation. Uh, rice and cotton conservation meeting and we presented the program and it kind of began to take hold, but it was still slow. And I, I asked my banker, I said, how can farmers not do this program when it saves so much money? And I think this says a lot for everything we do in conservation cover crops and all. You know, I'm just comfortable doing what I've always done. And uh, that's the big thing is getting out of your comfort zone to try new things. The next thing came along, Fawcett was really not being supported as it should. Delta Plastics saw this. And I think they also saw if they're gonna continue to stay in business in the long term, they had to do something to help conserve water. So we had water to pump and they came out with pipe planter, basically Fawcett on steroids. And pipe planter really began to take hold. And I would say today in this part of the world, we're 80% or better um, with people that's using the deposit or pipe planter. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the best things that ever happened to uh, Mid-South agriculture. The next thing came along was a discovery farm. I think I was approached in 2011 and uh, asked to um, become a cotton discovery farm. Um, our water ran into the Mississippi River. Um, we were being charged with causing the epoxia in the Gulf. And, and um, my history of, of uh, working with uh, university research, I think they, for some reason, my name came up. And they approached me about doing this. And the first thing I thought, whoa, we're going to get all these numbers and EPA is going to be right down on my back and I'll lose the farm before this is over. Well, months went on and I was still saying no. And Debbie Moreland that, that uh, is president of the Conservation uh, Districts Association in Arkansas said, Steve, I know, I know you. If you've got a problem, you want to fix it. 
if you got a problem, we'll help you fix it. How do you say no to that? So we became a cotton discovery farm. And um, I'll never forget sitting in this spot right here, Mike Daniels, that, that was our, our to-go-to -to man, said, Steve, I'd like for you to try faucet on a couple of fields. And I said, Mike, we can't do that. He kind of grinned. He said, why not? I said, because we already do it on 100% of our fields. He said, oh, okay, can you just not do it on a couple of fields? I said, no, we're not going backwards. Well, we kind of had to work through that. And uh, of course we tried surge valves and um, uh, a lot of technology came to the farm. This is um, one of our stations. We have four fields that was, that was on it. And as you can see from the top, this is our rainfall runoff. And you can see there's quite a bit of it. Um, and the water has got a lot of coloration in it. And as we, what we found from that, it also had higher amounts of, of N and P. In the bottom is our irrigation water. You can see it's very clear and our numbers were extremely low from our irrigation events. Get my thoughts here. Um, this kind of presented something to us that was, you know, a, a little bell went off, but we're doing a pretty good job. The data showed we had small amounts of N and P. Crop removal rates were often balanced, and this is something that we did. We put out the amount that you, of nutrients that you needed to make a average crop, and there was always enough reserves in the, in the soil if you had the right kind of weather you had the fertilizer there for good crops. And we didn't put it out until after the stand establishment. I think that was a, a good part of our, our, our program. But we had high efficiency, good environmental stewardship, and we found we were not contributing to the hypoxia. This slide is where we really can take a lot of our talking points. As you can see with the irrigation water going down the field, the water doesn't move very far on the soil road. This goes back to the many years of eight to 14 trips. Our organic matter was 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Our best soils were, was one, or I think Midwest soils are like four to five. Um, Chris Henry put some moisture sensors right under the row, four, or no, they were six, 12, and 18 inches. And he had told me, he said, call me when you start irrigation. Well, we were busy and I forgot about it. We had already gone through about three, three irrigation cycles. And Chris called me up and he said, when are you going to start pumping? And I said, Chris, we already have. Uh, he said, no, you hadn't. I said, Chris, we've gone through three irrigation cycles. No, you hadn't. Chris came from Nebraska where they had good soil health. What we found here from, from this very thing, we didn't have any soil health and something needed to happen. The roots would go, go out into the middle and pick it up, but you really didn't absorb that much water, whether it's from irrigation or even rainfall because it wasn't going through the soil profile. We were farming the top six inches and the rest of the water was just running off the, off the field. So Bill suggested that we subsoil. And I said, Bill, you know, we've done that in the past. It's short lived. And if you have a wet spring, you have trouble getting the crop in on time. If you have a wet fall, you have trouble getting it out. Let's look for something else. And Bill thought about it a little while and he said, what do you think about cereal rye? I said, you talking cover crop? He said, yeah. That's... So we tried 50 units, 50 acres. The first year we did half of two fields. And the point of doing half especially with irrigation cycles, you can see what you're doing. And what we found the first year, earthworms came back, which surprised me. I didn't know they would come back that fast. But in, in running the, the, water set, the water volumes, we were putting twice as much water in the soil where the cover crop was not till cover as compared to the farmer standard. This was a game changer. This was something I could see that we needed to expand. This is what it looks like when, when you're actually doing an irrigation cycle. 
course, you can't see it here in the picture, but if you fold back the, the cover, the ground was, was saturating all the way across the road metal and all, just like a, a heavy clay soil does. So we had totally changed the soil structure in one year. Some of the things we've learned from this, I thought, well, we can do this for two or three years and then we can back off a couple of years. Doesn't work that way. You have to put a cover crop every year. Another thing that we learned was like nitrogen source. Um, we took a field and, and, and split it in half with like 32% um, uran injected into the soil and, and urea. We found we had a lot less loss from the injected from the 32% uran. So we used Discovery Farm to try as many different things as we could to, um, to see. And a lot of this stuff was done, Cotton Incorporated has a certain amount of money that they they send to the states and our state support um, committee was really good about sending some of this money for projects for bill to work and, and dig in the soil. We had cotton roots, non-cover non crop, six inches, cotton roots with a cover crop, 18 inches. I didn't think that was possible in our soils. Uh, but there were so many things that was learned by, by having the, the, the university research in combination with the discovery farm um, that, you know, we could just look at so many variables. Things that were monitored was irrigation and rainfall, runoff volume, NP and suspended um, solids in the runoff. Field to market foot field print, sustainability metrics. In the marketplace today, the market is demanding that that a cotton farmer be sustainable. The consumer wants their, their cotton to, to be a low environment footprint. If you look on the left, no-till cover, you see the blue is a, is a very small area compared to the till and no cover, which I would call farmer standard bedded in the fall, knock it down, which you're looking at three trips before the platter. But as you can see, <laughs> we are much more sustainable with the no-till cover. Now this translates into something else. Um, it was, I thought it was a lot of trouble at the time, but I'm glad we went to that trouble. Bill had us to turn in every time we made a trip, what size tractor, what size implement, what did you put out, what was the rate? So they were tracking our cost on a dry year. Our cost of production was nine cents a pound less than farmer standard. On a fairly wet year, that cost of production was sometimes the same, sometimes one to three cents less. The average over a period of time, that average was five to cents, five to six cents a pound less cost of production than farmer standard. What this shows is we can be environmentally responsible and still make money. In fact, we can make better money. The bottom line does look better if we farm in a sustainable way. With that, we <clears throat> just sum summarized, computerized hole selection, increased irrigation efficiency. Um, and these are very conservative. I was losing 40% and, and there's, and, uh, by not using it. And we, we reached 90% efficiencies with this. Nutrient sediment losses were lower from irrigation runoff than as compared to, to um, rainfall. <coughs> Nutrient losses were 5% or below on average. Most of the time they were less than 2% in the numbers that I were looking at. Cover crops and reduced tillage, reduce the environmental footprint, documenting improved sustainability that the cotton supply chain needs and improved profitability that producers need. It's a win-win for the producer. I think the biggest problem is, is just getting producers out of the, uh, the deal of, I've always done it this way and I don't, I'm, I'm afraid to change. I'm just afraid of the unknown. Uh, with that, you know, the whole idea is produce a profitable crop and um, and we do that through uh, through research.
with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass it back to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens. You have um, tons of great information there in your slides, but also just the wealth of information from your perspective and seeing things change um, um, across the years of your experience on the farm. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We've got to get out of our comfort zone, and sometimes that's the hardest part to do. Um, if I can ask you to stop sharing your screen, Mr. Stevens, then that way we can get um, Adam queued up um, for for his presentation. And um, just to let folks know who are on the call, um, we originally planned to go into some breakouts, um, but I think what we'll do is we will, um, after we hear from Adam, and he's got some great um, slides to show us and comments as well. It's always fun to have a conversation with Adam. Um, we'll um, use our chat and um, type those questions in. I see a few questions going into the chat now. And then we'll hear, we'll um, pose those questions to our panelists um, after Adam's comments. So um, Adam and Betsy Lash own and operate a highly diversified crop and livestock operation in Wisconsin. Um, they, since implementing 100% no-till and cover crop quality, water filtration, soil, um, they're focused on increasing resiliency through interseeding, mixed species intercropping, and expanded rotation. Um, Adam uses these experiences to help guide other farmers down the path toward greater soil health and higher whole farm profitability. And I think your comments, Adam, will probably align nicely with what we just heard from Mr. Stevens as well. So um, I will let you take it away, Adam, and you can share your screen if you have trouble with that just let us know. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Can everybody see my screen? We are not seeing your slides, Adam. You're not seeing it. Let me go back here. Let me share now. Can you see this? Oh, let's go. When you're, when you're selecting share yep, screen, yep, yep. it should give you the option for your slides. Yep, 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 right here. While Adam's getting um, set up there, if everybody can be thinking about the questions that they have for our, our panelists or other farmers. Oh, looks like you're starting to- How's that? Yes, we can see that. If you'll yep, hit that button there where your mouse is and we'll see it full screen. That little screen over on the bottom right corner. You can enlarge your slides a little bit. Right right there um there's a little screen um looks like a projection screen down by the in the bottom right yep you yep got it. i'm hitting that is that all right I'm not working for you guys no we're not that's okay we can see your slides well enough for now so you can just move through them this way all righty so i was asked to um talk about what we're doing and uh i, I don't I don't, I'm not going to go into the deep data. I'm just going to kind of stay broad picture and talk about what farmers can do to implement, implement covers and stay resilient in times of challenge. And I think everybody can, can agree we've had that. So this is my family. This is why we farm. Um, my wife, Betsy, and my two little boys, um, the one with the, um, on my lap is Boone, and he is now eight. And Rhett is on Betsy's lap, and, and he is uh, now five, almost six. And I'd like to turn your attention to the fact that he is almost bald. Um, Adam, Adam, if you'll take yep. your arrow down and highlight that next slide, then we'll see it change. Because right now we're just seeing your first slide highlighted. All righty. All righty. So we'll go. go like that. Is that better? Yep, that's perfect. How come I can't get it to share the whole part? So that's we'll okay. do that. Anyway, so. Okay. So again, Boone is on the, uh, I can't hear you. We're hearing you. Boone is, okay, Boone is on my lap. I'm just gonna keep going then. Boone is on my lap. And uh, Betsy has got my son, Rat, our youngest son, Rat. And he's six. And uh, he, he got a lesson the day, this was taken in September. Um, two years ago, and uh, he got a lesson in understanding 
and consequences. So he, we, we use a, um, a paste to dehorn our calf. So we have to take a little calf clipper and um, cut off the hair around the, the horn bud for the, for the calves. Well, he got into that thing that he had just gotten done uh, working calves, threw the bucket off to the side. Rat, being a um, mischievous little five-year-old, decided he was going to go do the same thing. And uh, he, this is the day we were going to take this picture. My <laughs> wife was so mad when she saw that. And I was just laughing. I thought it was great. But look at the smile. I was like, oh, I got to take a picture of this. So that's where I want to start. This is my family. That's why I'm, we farm. We're trying to, we want to stay home and raise the kids. And I think anybody who's farming and has a family, you, you, you guys can understand that. So now to talk about some of the challenges we've had. Um, this was the calculated soil moisture anomaly in 2019. So this is February of 19. And we, I don't know if you can see my little screen, my little um, pointer. We are right there in the southeast corner of Wisconsin. And uh, we were wet. We were extremely wet coming out of winter. Um, I don't know, most people understand how wet 2019 was. It was ridiculously wet in our area. It was the wettest year we've ever had. Just uh, maybe not for you guys down south, but we had 60 inches of rain plus 45 inches of snow. And this was by far the hardest year I've ever had to farm. Um, just when you can't even get outside to do anything because the mud is bad. And the worst part of it was we weren't, it wasn't like we got big rain events. It was three tenths every day for a week. So you just, you start adding moisture up because you never got a chance to dry out. And it was incredibly frustrating. So 2020, this is, this is February of last year. We were still wet. Um, turns out we had ended up into a pretty good year in 2020 because of some of the practices that we had implemented from you know, since we started. So 2017, we're milking cows. We weren't really thinking about anything. We're doing cover crops. We're doing our thing, kind of come along. 2018, the back half of 2018 was extremely wet. All of a sudden, we got kind of tripped up a little bit in our harvest. So we were going into 2019 in kind of a, a poor feed situation for the cattle. 20, uh, 2019 happens, and oh my goodness, it was a total knockdown. Pretty hard to deal with. We learned a lot, though. We, we were able to adapt. We, we saw the value of soil health incredibly. Um, that's what really kept us going. The cover crops and the ability to be flexible and, and move where Mother Nature was telling us to do. In 2020, we actually, aside from COVID, had a really good year. We were able to put up some really good quality feed. We really saw the payoffs come from the soil health and the covers. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about covers because I really think that's integral to, to being a resilient farm and having, having the ability to protect the resource and really build it up. So definition of re resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties um, or toughness or the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Elasticity, and I, I want to talk about resilience in more than one way. You got personal resilience, how, how well you deal with challenges. You've got um, soil health resilience, so how fast can your resource bounce back after, a, say, an event like tillage or an event like um, a herbicide pass or or even a, a hard grazing event. Um, livestock needs to be resilient. So if we if we've kind of built our system around a bunch of animals that are not quite adapted to our system, that can cause a lot of problems. So resilience is kind of our one one big idea how quick can we how quick can we recover when challenges come because they're going to come there's no there's no way they're not going to going to happen so the way we've kind of we're, we're working on some things and, and one of the newest ones is how do we how do we use the soil health yield income and 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 tie it all together and what we kind of came up with is is everybody wants a bigger bank account they want to have more assets cattle equipment crops um, buildings, whatever, what, ha what have you. But nobody really talks about the biological capital. And, and I think this needs to be a bigger focus on our farms. Um, and what I mean by biological capital is, is the genetics in our livestock, how well they're adapted to go through those tough times. How about soil health and the microbes and the ability to, to maybe not have to apply so much fertilizer? Um, maybe, maybe the ability to, to crowd out weeds and, and the, just the soil health, the general soil health and the increase in the microbes and the organic matter. I mean, uh, Steve there was talking about 1.5% organic matter. That is incredibly low in my opinion. Obviously, even in a warmer climate, it's hard to build it up down there. Um, we have been really blessed. But we, it's a little snow and, coldy, snow and snowy and cold out here right now, 
but so we get a little bit of a rest, but we've been able, actually able to increase our soil organic matter um, upwards of uh, almost 2% since implementing this, this, these practices about seven years ago. So huge, huge, uh, huge benefit to increasing your biological capital. And I, I found that that just increases your yield and pro productivity. You're actually able to sell more of that produce productivity and that increases more income. That increased income can be used to apply more practices to increase soil health. Maybe you increase your mixes. Um, you start going with a little bit more expensive to type um, uh, seed mixes. Maybe you invest in new equipment to help bigger drills or more uh, more advanced um, equipment or monitoring even, say, something like a soil heat, uh, team test. So you can increase the soil health. And then that will in turn increase your biological capital. And then it's just a cycle that feeds on itself. And that's the whole goal. And ultimately, the, the thing that comes out of that is increased resilience. So what I want to talk about, I'm going to go pretty heavy on the livestock and the forage side. We do quite a bit of crops. Um, we've got data on that. But I want to talk about just what we have seen and where, where, why I'm such a big believer in the alternative forage crops and the huge biological diversity that we can bring to the table to benefit our livestock and our soil. So I'm going to go through these quick, quick couple pictures. The, the picture in the top left is in 2019. Actually, the bottom three pictures, the bottom two pictures and the one on the left, were all from 2019 when we were just getting so much rain. We essentially had one good week where we could get um, some stuff planted. And it wasn't, we got, we mudded stuff in in early June nothing got done in april or may early june we had like a week long window to get your some of the crops planted and then we had another good one um shortly after uh end of july and just give you a uh just give you an example we had upwards of fifty thousand acres in our um county that went prevent plant it was just an astronomical amount we were super wet um neighbor of mine couple thousand acres, half of his land didn't get planted just because you couldn't get on it. So this is actually on some of that prevent plant ground, this top left picture. Um, look at the look at the number of bales there. That is like a 10 acre field and just a huge amount of bales that we could get off. So by planting a cover crop in the end of July, um, we were able to actually get some seed made to help uh, get us through the next year because there was the hay crops were, were underwater. There was no, you could not get forage made hardly at all. This uh, bottom left picture is a, a picture of our, our old neighbor. I actually rent some ground from him. We have a uh, self propelled windrower that we use, and there was no way we were going to be able to get through this field. On this particular field, um, and I'm going to talk about the other good idea I've had is let Mother Nature tell us what practices to use where. So, this particular farm. It's, it's incredibly wet. There was no way we were going to get planted to corn. And if we did, we would have pulled off maybe 80 or 100 bushel of corn. So what we ended up doing is we, when it got dry, we snuck out there and we kind of, it was a little on the wet side, but we mudded in a cover crop. And uh, now this is in September. And uh, the old neighbor, he's like, well, how are you ever going to get through that without making huge ruts? Well, I said, well, you've got a nine foot window or a light little tractor. Why don't you sneak out there and see what you can do? Can do. So he laid it all down. We laid it as wide as we could. And the day after we mowed it, he got two inches of rain on it that night. And it was, I woke up the next morning. Oh my goodness. Well, we, because we had some soil health, we had some structure. We were able to wrap it up as baling. We, it went 12 bales to the acre with a $50 cover crop and a little bit of night. So that talk about resilience. I mean, you would, we, the rest of the hay fields, the perennial pastures were not making five bales to the acre for the whole year. It was just terrible. So just showing you how dense and how lush that was. The top right picture is actually last year. We, uh, we had good results with that cover. Let's, let's, let's try something else. So we, we, we have now decided that we're going to focus heavier on using some of these alternative forages. And that is me. I'm six foot four. That is a gigantic cover crop that did almost 30 tons of the acre with $50 for the seed and 100 units of nitrogen. And we did one herbicide pass very or shortly after planting. But one thing I want to draw, I don't know if you guys can see it real great, but look how cloudy the other three pictures are, and it's bright and sunny. So look at, look at the effect that photosynthesis can have, sunlight can have on the growth of those crops. Just, it's just amazing. Um, so that's the forages side. 
the, the, as far as the way to get resilient with planting corn or crops is the covers. I can't talk enough about the cover crops. So the, these are our cereal rye and triticale, and we've mixed in some hairy vetch, some winter peas. We've got some forage rape out there. Um, in this picture with the corn planter, we're actually planting into uh, white clover, red clover, and cereal rye. Um, there's a few weeds in there, but not too bad. And and this has given us the ability to capture nutrients, prevent soil soil loss and water runoff, and we're actually infiltrating what we what we what lands on our field. That in turn has allowed the soil to be more resilient and and uh, hold us up. We have a nice root uh, structure, so we almost have like rebar in our heavy clay soil. And that's given us more resiliency. We can go out, you know, when we don't have the best conditions today, but we still need to get the crop planted. Um, this cornfield ended up doing 220 bushels um, on 180 units of nitrogen. Um, and that was actually after taking off the forage crop. That's why we had to put on a little bit more nitrogen. We actually ended up removing quite a bit of seed. Um, so you can see that I took a picture. So part of that resiliency is figuring out which hybrids and such we want to use. And this was destined to be a, a silage crop. So we ended up using um, a, a variety of like very low populations, and it ended up um, a lot of those years made two and, and three years. It was it was incredible. Um, one trial I'm actually pretty proud of that was kind of neat. Um, we we're trying to increase diversity. So we thought, okay, what's the problem with the soybean crop? They're incredibly hard on the soil. So in soybeans are a legume, they produce a lot of nitrogen, they eat up a lot of soil carbon. Um, how, how can we, what else can we grow with soybeans to actually get, um, let's get some of the soil, same soil health benefits while we're growing the crop. And, and this was pretty neat. So we, we did several different varieties. We did, uh, um, these are conventional soybean with um, no herbicide traits. We did a spring burn down pass into a cover crop of cereal rye. And uh, the picture on the left, we started to add, and we thought, okay, well, what, why don't we, since we have cattle, dairy cows, why don't we try and make a whole in protein that we can feed to the dairy cows? So we were going to use this. We'll take these soybeans, we'll grind them, and we'll press them, and we'll actually feed them to the livestock for the dairy cows, and we'll, we'll use our own um, protein. At the time this stuff was planted, that was last spring, soybeans were sitting at seven seventy a bushel. It's like, well, why would I sell seven dollar beans when I can um, and then buy back three hundred and sixty dollar uh, soybean meal? I'll just grow my own. So we did some different trials. We did some buckwheat. We did some flax. We did some sunflowers. Um, the thing I will say is this: you can see the transition here between the two. The foreground, those beans made seventy bushel, and that was just with flax and buckwheat. When you throw the sunflowers in, they cost me about 30 bushels in yield because the sunflowers um, just kind of shaded out. We, we tried different different seeding rates. They just shaded out the soybeans too much to even be able to get uh, much first. We made, they made 40 bushels, so it, it was fine, um, but we learned a lot. It cost, cost us quite a bit of yield there. So we're, we're going to continue to expand with this. I, honestly, I believe flax needs to be planted into flax, flax and possibly even oats if you want to spray them out later. Um, they're highly mycorrhizal. We're going to plant flax with every acre of soybeans this year because they they just it, the soil health was or the plant health was fantastic. The pollinators that take forever to plant or to they take they're an indeterminate variety, so they flower all the time. So you always have some pollinators uh, there even um, early earlier than the soybean, and uh, the plant health was phenomenal. And the nice thing is when you combine them, you can just basically blow, blow whatever seed from the flax right off the back. They're such a small seed. So it, it's a companion crop that we're really excited about. Um, and then just, just some other things that we do over the possibilities. I mean, we, the, the, the grazing has become a bigger part. We, have, we can't do it on all the acres we would like to. Um, and we would love to be able to do it more with the dairy cows, but just big animals on wet ground doesn't tend to lend to it. So we've tried some different interspecies, intercropping, different species. The, tra the picture of the tractor there is, um, well, we can't get the cows on certain acres. Why don't we just carry the fresh feed back to the cows? So we've really done a lot of with the zero grazing, which has allowed, allowed us to have some extra flexibility um, as far as timing. We still get the benefits of the animal health. We don't rut the ground up quite as much, and we still get the uh, get the forage off. So it, it's working well. We've kind of built our dairy system around this in, during the growing season the last couple of years. Um, it's, been, it's been good, but I hope you guys understand our, our biggest thing is we don't 
want to try and force anything. We want to let Mother Nature tell us what we want to do on our on our ground or in certain situations. So one of the things I learned early on was the most expensive thing you can do is to try and change the environment to suit your certain practice. So whatever you think you want to do, the most expensive thing you can do is to try and change that land to suit a, a practice that it may not be suited for. So uh, you see this in a lot in, in modern agriculture. It's, you know, if we have a square peg and a round hole, we're not going to try and go find a round peg. We're going to go grab a bigger hammer. We're going to force it in there. And I've learned that the, the less I fight that, the better, uh, the better the outcomes usually. And then one big thing is um, without counsel, plants can go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So big time is talk to people. This, that's why I'm so excited to, to do Zoom meetings like this or, or phone calls and stuff. We all have a cell phone on our hip. You got a question, reach out to somebody. There's a lot of experience out there that can be shared um, going forward. So with that, I'm, I'm going to finish up, and I thank everybody for your attention. Any questions, give me a call. Adam, thank you so much um, for sharing your experiences. Um, I know I've probably got a thousand questions I could ask you um, about how you're interceding and, and using um, the, the, the mix of, of seed that you're using there. Um, we have one direct question to you um, from Adam Braun about your seeding rates um, for the companion flax and oats. Can you speak to your seeding rates? Yeah, so we have different seeding rates. We did, uh, so anywhere from like five to, to 10 pounds, I think seems to be about the sweet spot. Um, the sunflowers, we were anywhere from, from say two pounds all the way up to 10 and it, it was just too high. So flax, I think we could go as high as 10. Um, it depends on the seeding, uh, seeding rating or soybeans. We ended up drilling our soybeans, so we had a solid sanded stand because it was a it was a drill um, it was a non it was a non GMO variety. So we were we wanted the the shading effect of of the crop canopy. Um, and then all we had to do we we don't have a I shouldn't we don't have a lot of water hemp um, because of the cover crops. We haven't seen that. A lot of our neighbors' fields tend to have that. So I'm always kind of leery. It's like, oh boy, we could have a real big outbreak pretty quick, and then we're going to have some issues, um, especially growing non GMO. But I, I don't know. The flax just plays nice. So five to 10, try it. Um, if you're a little leery of it, go a little lower. The nice thing with flax is a lot of the same soybean herbicides are labeled, obviously, aside from glyphosate or um, Enlist. But a lot of them are labeled on flax. So um for grass control is labeled for flax. So it was that's kind of where we when we went with that. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, do any of our um, folks that are on the call do you all have questions? Um, you, you can use the chat box. You can unmute yourself and ask the question that you might have. Um, and while we're um, taking these um, questions, if Erica can um, can launch our um, our last poll, um, we can stay on for a few extra minutes. Um, I've been just really enthralled with our speakers today, and I am just uh, just overwhelmed with the information that they shared. I could listen to all of you just speak. Um, for a long time. So, um, but I wanna make sure that we get our, our questions um, of our speakers answered. Um, I know there was a question in the chat about, um, you know, what the risk might be of engaging in on-farm trials. And um, I see that Matt and Beth and, and Mike um, and Amber have all chimed in there. And, and basically, I think the question really was, you know, what about the risk? And are there examples of, of these trials that, you know, are, are on farm fields that don't go well or what happens. And, and so um, the, and, and Beth or Amber or Mike uh, or Matt, anybody, you know, speak up if you want to clarify your comments, but it sounds like just being flexible and resilient um, to, um, you know, to what happens on the farm, because that's just, you know, some of the nature of, of agriculture. It's the nature of research. It's the nature of a, variable climate that, that we're all getting accustomed to. Amanda, I wanted to say one thing. I, you know, when we work with farmers like Steve Stevens, they make us so much better. Uh, Steve 
<clears throat> will challenge you at times to say, hey, you, 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 you can do this. Uh, and if something does go wrong, he, he usually comes up with the best solutions of all of us. But uh, it's really a partnership approach. Uh, I'll give you one example. We were monitoring runoff the first year. Um, and at the end of the year, I gave him a report, how much runoff he got, and this and that. And Bill Robertson, our cotton agronomist, had been working with Steve. And, and Steve had been saying, you know, I don't know how uh, to adjust for rainfall for my irrigation. It may say I rained a half inch, but I see some of it running off. So I don't know what credit to give it. And so I gave him the year end report and he said, why are you waiting till the end of the year to get this information? Can you get it to me as soon as we get through irrigating? And I said, yes. And so we were, we did that for several years. We need to get, uh, I found out last year we didn't provide that information, but uh, we could give him the runoff amount and adjust the irrigation amount and come up with an effective, what Bill Robertson calls an effective rainfall because we can subtract out we're monitoring the runoff and uh, that was very helpful to adjusting the amount of water that he uh, was using and it's that type of innovation I would have never thought of that I was he he found some stuff that we were doing that could help him right away and so we were giving him that information thank you for joining our virtual shop talk today you can find more virtual shop talks on our website.